You are listening to This is Oklahoma, hosted by Mike Hearn, telling stories of Oklahomans and those that have made it their home. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of This is Oklahoma podcast. Mike Hearn here, your host, back with another episode. Excited to share this episode with you today. But before we do, I've got to thank our sponsors. First of all, the Oklahoma Hall of Fame. They've been a huge part of this podcast for the last few years. So the Oklahoma Hall of Fame have been sharing an Oklahoma story through its people since 1927. For more information on the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, go to www.oklahomahof.com. And for daily updates, go to Oklahoma HOF on Instagram and give them a follow. Our other sponsor today is the Chicksaw Nation. Now, the Chicksaw Nation have sponsored pretty much everything in Oklahoma. They're a huge supporter of Oklahoma. And it's an honor to have their name and their brand supporting this podcast. So a huge shout out to Governor Anna Toby for supporting this podcast. It really means a lot. And finally, our third sponsor is 988. The Oklahoma 988 Mental Health Lifeline, 988 is a direct three-digit lifeline that connects you with trained behavioral health professionals that can get all Oklahomans the help that they need. Learn more by visiting 988oklahoma.com. That's 988oklahoma.com. And now, let's get into today's episode. Today, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce Mr. Tom McDaniel to the podcast, former Oklahoma Hall of Fame inductee, I believe it was 06, um, golfer, which we're gonna, I'm sure we're going to talk about a little bit of golf today. But uh, Tom, thanks so much for coming down. Excited to uh, share some of your stories. I'm glad to be with you. So we've just been chatting. You're 84 years old. Yes. Uh, you're still playing golf. And a few days ago, a few weeks ago, you had a hole in one. I did. It was my fifth. Okay. So I, but I, so I've been playing. I've been playing a long time. But uh, uh, my golf doesn't seem to be getting better. But you know, sometimes good luck overcomes. If you uh, play enough, else. right? If you play enough, the odds are that you might get yes, one. Exactly. Uh, tell me about it. Which hole? Where are we at? What club? <laughs> I was playing at uh, Oklahoma City Golf and Country Club, Mm -hmm. and uh, it was number six, which is a par three. I, of course, uh, admit I was playing the senior tees. I wasn't playing back where you play, but I was playing the senior tees. It was about 145 or 50 yards. So just... uh, Pretty fortunate that it that it went in. As you know, you can hit a lot of great shots that don't go in. Yeah, uh, six is uphill. Did you see it go in? Uh, we no. Okay. We. I mean, I could see it going toward the hole, but yeah. we did not. Uh, I couldn't see it rolling the hole. It hit on the green and rolled toward the pin, and so there were some guys on the next tee yeah. that started jumping up and down and yelling at us. And so I knew then that uh, something really great had happened. That is awesome. And that, was that in your regular kind of chops group that you guys played with? Yes, I I played with uh, some guys that are about my age. There's a retired uh, commander from Tinker Air Force Base named Dick Burpee, Mm -hmm. uh, a friend and neighbor named Bill Shadid, and uh, a real estate guy named Gerald Gamble. Okay. And we play together on Saturday mornings. That's awesome. What a, what a time, right? What, what an experience. And I know uh, I used to work out at Oklahoma City, and that's kind of how we met a long yes. time ago. But uh, it's kind of fun for you because I believe you live close to six, right? You only live off right of one, and then you can I see do. six from, from the yes, back of your house. We, yes, we live yeah. uh, along the number one fairway there. What a great thing. Love it. Hole in ones are just special, regardless of where it is, who you are, how old you are. It's, it's something that everyone, if you're a golfer, you want to have one, right? I agree. Awesome. So, a lot of people know you, I think, probably would be, you know, as, as former president of Oklahoma City University and just a lover of education. You're, you know, the McDaniel family name has done a lot of things and is very kind of prominent in the city and the state. So, I'm excited to share some stories today. You know, you have three sons, all of them doing great things. Um, but let's go all the way back. Where were you born and raised? I was born in uh, Muskogee, Oklahoma. Okay. Uh, I, my parents didn't live there. They lived in a little town called Stigler, uh, which is about 40 miles uh, east of there. Mm-hmm. But that uh, I was born in 1938, so that was the closest hospital. Mm-hmm. So born in Muskogee, Oklahoma. Uh, my father... Uh, had a small business there, which he uh, sold when he went to the uh, Navy during World War II, when I was a 
pretty small child when he came back from the war he went to work for the state and so we moved around several places i've lived in several oklahoma cities mainly in rural areas until moving to oklahoma city as an adult oh wow so growing up then what what was i guess um because a lot of people see you you know you're big in education was education big for your family was was mom and um, was mom a teacher How, how do you get to be in education I think education became really big for my mom and dad because they neither one went to college. They they both got a high school education, uh, although I'd like to think I'm not overly spoiled. uh, I was an only child. And uh, my parents, uh, their generation went through the big depression. Uh, My father was in the Navy in World War II, as I've mentioned. My mother stayed there and tried to keep the business going. But their their life experience uh, when they were your age was pretty tough sledding. And so from the, as long as I can remember, uh, they said, you have got to get a college education and you're going to have to make good grades and you're going to have to apply yourself because uh, if you're going to take care of your family, you've got to have an education in the next yeah. generation. So they instilled that in me, even though they didn't yeah. have an education. That's great. I love that. So plan then, obviously, as you're going through high school, education is a huge thing. Were you big in athletics as well in high school? I I was. By the time I went to high school, I'd gone to several different schools, but I ended up in Colgate, Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And uh, I... uh, my story is probably kind of a, a unique one in a couple of ways. I'd, I'd never played football. I'd gone to rural schools and really loved to play basketball. Okay. And we moved to Colgate, and uh, the day they were unloading the truck in the little house we were renting, a guy comes by and introduces himself and tells me that uh, he's the football coach there, and he's got a couple of guys that live in the neighborhood that have come to help us unload the truck and uh, they became two lifelong friends of mine and the coach uh, said I uh, I said well I really like basketball and he said well it'll help you get acquainted and stuff if you play football so I did I started playing football and it turns out while I wasn't a, a fantastic athlete or anything, I did have a knack for throwing the ball. So by the time I was a junior, uh, I moved in as a freshman, by the time I was a junior, I was the quarterback. And uh, he told me my senior year, if you if you have a good year and the team has a good year, I think I can get you a scholarship to play football. Oh, wow. And so uh, we did have a good year yeah. and uh, got to the state playoffs. And so true to his word, uh, he got me two or three offers to play college football and basketball. So I played both football and basketball, but I wasn't a terrific athlete. I don't want to say that because I played at a regional university at a small small school. But it, for me, it was a great place. I hadn't wasn't sophisticated, hadn't traveled much. Yeah. Uh, it was just like a big high school, absent the parents. Yeah. So it was a terrific place for me. I went to Northwestern. Okay. Alpha. Yeah. By that time, my father had been transferred up to northwestern Oklahoma. So of uh, the choices I had, that was the one closest to where they were. Yeah. So I went to northwestern Oklahoma State University and played football and basketball. Oh, wow. I'm sure that mom and dad were thrilled that you had gotten a scholarship to go to higher education. Well, yes, because their their budget was modest. Mm-hmm. And uh, they were my, my, my mom was a stay-at-home mom, and my dad had a pretty uh, pretty modest his job and so it was uh, it was uh, really important to yeah. get that scholarship yeah one of the things that I, and I probably said this many times on the podcast is that the lifelong friends that you build from team environments right yes. from that basketball team or that football team you know you've got friends and you've got memories from from you know 60 years ago right of all these exactly. friends that you've had like that's incredible those two, those two guys that helped unload that uh, unload that van when I was a freshman, mm-hmm. I talked to last week. Yeah, one is uh, lives in Sulphur, Oklahoma, and the other one in Wichita, Kansas, and we talk 
frequently. That's awesome. Yeah, that's the one thing that I, I kind of, you know, you want every parent to get their kid into sports, right? Because I of agree. that, you know, it's, you're kind of forced to play together early on and then you build these friendships. And like I said, you might find two or three that become lifelong friends, which... Exactly. You know, that, 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 that is special. So you go to Alva, you're playing in Northwestern Oklahoma State. What was the degree choice at that time? I majored in business, uh, minored in, uh, you'll be interested in journalism and speech. Okay. I, I did that because I don't, I don't know exactly how the idea got into my mind early in my life, but I, I knew I wanted to be a lawyer. Uh -huh. And so I was taking courses that I thought would prepare me for law school. And, uh, and Northwestern was really great to me. I loved the school and, and uh, made a lot of friends, and that's where I met my wife. Oh, that's, you met Brenda in Alva? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Tell me about that day then. Where'd you, how'd you meet her? Well, um, in those days, if you had a football scholarship, you had some kind of a job. And my job was to help clean the head football coach's office, which was not a rigorous job. Right, <laughs> yeah. Could have been a lot worse. <laughs> but, so uh, he taught a class for... Uh, called uh, First Aid, which was an elective, and I, my wife was a year younger than me, and, and uh, I was asked, uh, I, by that time I was the quarterback on the football team, I was asked to participate in orientation, so I go to orientation, and I see this freshman girl in the crowd that uh, I thought was about the cutest girl I'd ever seen, had an unusual voice, uh, very unique personality. And so uh, when I saw that she was in a class of mine, I fixed the seating chart so I would be sitting by her. And uh, that we've now been married 63 years. Wow. That's awesome. That, it was it easier back in, easier back then to fix the cheating uh, the seating chart as it is now. Well, the coach was uh, was the teacher, so he was he, <laughs> he permitted me to do that. That's great. <laughs> That's so good. I'd love to get her story on that as well on her side of the story. Yeah, she can tell it in a very unique way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so when you're going through university, you're playing football, you're playing basketball. You say you want to become a lawyer. So after that, then do you apply to law school after you you graduate? from Alva? Yes. I, uh, Brenda and I got married uh, the summer before my, my senior year and her junior year at Northwestern. And I applied for law school and so finished up at Northwestern, uh, got a, admitted to law school and we moved to Norman. Okay. and went to law school at the University of Oklahoma. Yeah, and like I said, that was kind of your dream at the time was to become a lawyer. Yes, it was. Yeah. yeah. Why, why Why? did you want to become a lawyer? Was there anyone growing up that you kind of looked up to that was a lawyer, or, or was it just kind of, I want to be involved and I want to... There was someone okay. that I looked up to and, my, and was a good friend of my father's. He, he lived when I was a child in Stigler, and uh, he had a really horrible thing happened to him, a, a war veteran that had PST that came back from the Second World War, kind of went on a shooting rampage oh, in wow. our town, and he shot this lawyer, and he spent the rest of his life paralyzed from the waist down, but he had such a great attitude. But my dad kept saying to me, see, if you're a lawyer, you you can continue to earn a living. You can continue to have a life, even if you have something really tragic happen in your life. But all of it with my parents was about you got to get ready to make a living because yeah. that's what they knew. I mean, they knew times could get hard, banks could yeah. fail. So it wasn't let's serve. You know, it wasn't let's just do something that you'd really like to do. It was, you got to get an education so yeah. you can make a living. Yeah. So did, was it kind of a, was it a, a tough conversation for them to, when you graduate to say, actually, I'm going to go to law school for another you know, few years, few years instead of going into work. Cause you could have gone to work at that point. Yes, I definitely could have gone to work, but they were 100% on board. Good. They, they were not able to help us much mm -hmm. in terms of finances, but Brent and I both worked uh, when we got to Norman. She 
finished her schooling, uh, we got a, a small loan. Mm -hmm. at, at the time, it seemed tremendous. We borrowed $800, <laughs> yeah. but tuition was lower, and, sure. and, and she got a job working for the university architect, and I got a job working for the district judge. Yeah. So I was a bailiff for him. So we worked, but we both worked, mm -hmm. and we didn't have many obligations, and we didn't start our family until after we got out, I got out of law school. So yeah. it was... Uh, it was uh, a Spartan existence, but at the time we didn't know any better. Yeah, and well, and also there's so many great memories I'm sure from those times. Oh right? yeah, like you lots, said, it's just you two, times. no yes. kids. You know, you kind of you go to work and you have school, but you also have some time to yourselves. And that's you know, exactly great right. Memories. So, do you realize at that point then? You know, clearly, you know, you go on to OU Law and and, and you you get there and. I'll, from people I've spoken to, seems like the first year in law school is the hardest year to get through. It is. It's, uh, and, and I think even harder in my day because we, uh, I did not have to pass the LSAT, the mm -hmm. law school uh, exam that you have to pass today. And so the, the process to eliminate people who were not going to make it was in the classroom there. Yeah. So it was about, when I started, there were 200 people in our class, and we knew that only about 100 would graduate. Mm. It's different today because they have the testing and they know whether or not you have the aptitude. Mm. And so this emphasis is more on everybody's going to succeed more than it is on half of you are going to fail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's kind of scary. Right. Yeah, and, and, you know, you don't stick at it if you don't love doing what you do, right? So clearly Absolutely. there was a passion there, and you had a passion for, for the law and, and becoming a lawyer. When did you realize what kind of subject of law you wanted to go into, and what do you want to specialize in? Well, I do want to say this. Uh, again, my wife and I were from... Uh, modest means in, in a rural setting. And I wasn't thinking about going to New York to practice law. I was thinking about I wanted to go to uh, an Oklahoma County seat town and mm -hmm. open a law practice and raise my family, uh, much like I'd been raised. And so my expectation at the time was that I would do that. And so when I graduated, I got an offer to come back to Alva, where Northwestern is, uh, because there were uh, there was a lawyer there that ha had known me in, at the at, at Northwestern. So we got offered a job, and we moved straight huh. back to Alva, and uh, where I practiced law for a few years. Oh wow, that's really nice to have those connections, right? To have that have it those is. friends, and they've known you for being in college for a few years, four years, and then, yeah. like I said, he says, "Come on back, I've got a." And, and you're obviously familiar with Alva because you spent so much time there and knew a lot of people. Yeah, and we knew a lot of people. And in a small town law practice, it's you know you have to build it over time, mm -hmm. and it's uh, it's a completely different thing yeah. than uh, uh, in a metropolitan area. I think. Sure. So at this point, then is this when when you you kind of think, hey, we've, we're settled now. We should start having a family. Well, yes. As a matter of fact, our first son, Mark, was born in uh, uh, September uh -huh. of 1963, and that I got I graduated from law school in May of '63, uh -huh. passed the bar in June of '63, and he was born in September. So it was a big year for big us. Big year, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> big year, yeah. But I remember wondering what I was going to do if I didn't pass the bar. Right. <laughs> because the job depended on it. It's a lot of pressure. It's a lot of pressure to have. And baby on the way. Yeah, So, yeah, yeah. yeah, I can't remember feeling much more pressure than that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, I've got to pass this test because not only does my, my career, you know, kind of my career is, you know, is there if I pass the test, but also I've got to put food on the table and feed a baby. That's kind of <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Too. Oh, that's brilliant. Um, so back in Alva, you've got a job, you have a small family at this time. I mean, it's 1963, like take us there. I mean, what is time like? What was, what was, I guess your plan as well? Did you plan to stay in Alva or did you think I'm going to go on and do bigger, better things? Again, I'll emphasize, I was a lot less sophisticated than you were when you got <laughs> right. out of college. And I was only thinking of getting a law practice started there. Uh, we immersed ourselves in the community. Mm -hmm. We had three sons that were all born there in fairly short order within about a six-year span. Mm -hmm. uh, we had three three sons, and they were all in school. Uh, and, uh, 
rural America and Alva as well uh, has really changed over the over the uh, uh, ensuing decades. But it was really alive, and there was a university there, and it was kind of uh, central to a lot of things we like to do. And at least at the time, my wife and I thought it was a great place uh, to raise a family. They could walk to school uh, from where we lived. They all three went to the same school. Uh, and had a uh, had a had a pretty good life that we we enjoyed. So you meant one thing you mentioned there is is being involved in the community. That's something that you're extremely well known for to this day. Where does that come from? Is that from mum and dad, or is that from something that you could just picked up that we need to be involved? Well, I I think that my mom and dad were involved in in the community, but but. Uh, I think I learned it more at the university. Yeah. Uh, I think the educational process, and particularly at the law school, uh, where there was a lot of uh, lot of emphasis put on not only serve your clients, but uh, there was a need for pro bono work and to serve others. And uh, then uh, by this time, uh, my wife and I had gotten really active in the church, uh, making sure our kids were get to church and so I think a lot of lessons learned through our faith uh, yeah. led us to believe that uh, getting involved and trying to serve mm -hmm. uh, was a great way to live yeah was was your uh, the your faith based and faith upbringing from mom and dad as well Did you go to church yes. with mom and dad a lot yes they were very active mm -hmm. uh, in the church in the small church where we grew up yeah. but at the time Brenda and I got married she had a job as secretary for the Methodist minister okay. in Alva and it didn't take me long to become a Methodist because she had a job there <laughs> right <laughs> so one of my first jobs after we got married she was the church secretary and I was the assistant a janitor <laughs> uh, the first year we were married so yeah. we uh, worked at the church and uh, got involved at the okay, church okay yeah so um, take us from from there then to when do you go to when do we come to Oklahoma City and, and you get involved I know you go you go work for Kerr McGee right is there a, I mean take us through those years and how do how does that how do you eventually get to Oklahoma City our uh, or am I by missing this time, our but this time our kids were getting. Uh, our oldest son was in high school. Yeah. The other two were in junior high, and uh, Brenda was thinking that uh, maybe there was more for us to do mm -hmm. than was available to do, and she kept saying to me, "You know, you're going to be doing the same thing when you're 65 that you're doing when you're 35. I mean, it's going to be the same people, the same." The same stuff, and uh, I think you ought to try to see what else is out there for you. And she's always been a person that uh, wouldn't look over the next the next hilltop and see what was there. So, just uh, kind of unexpectedly, uh, I got a call from uh, a Supreme Court justice in Oklahoma who was from our area, and yeah. he said, and Oklahoma during the 60s had gone through some really rough times uh, with the Oklahoma Supreme Court. There had been some, uh, a scandal. Mm -hmm. And so they had instituted a new, a new court system, and they had, uh, they had created a position called administrative director of the courts. So uh, a justice named Pat Irwin, from Western Oklahoma called me and said, why don't you come down here and interview for this job? We think you might be a good person to do this. So I came down and uh, they kind of arranged a special time because I was in court and had some detail problems. But anyway, interviewed for the job, came home. I said, Brenda, I feel so great. I made a step out toward trying to do this. Not a chance on earth I'm gonna get this job because most of the questions they asked me, I didn't. I don't think I answered the way they wanted. Mm -hmm. Did I know a lot of legislators? No. Was I familiar with how we might computerize the courts? No. And so I thought I was not the person that was. And then uh, at about 6.30 the next morning, Pat Irwin called me and said, we've decided to hire you. Can you be here next Monday? And it was a life-changing event because I was in the middle of a law practice and had lots of 
other things going on, lots of obligations to clients. And I said, well, gee, he said, when can you be here? And I said, well, this is December. I said, first of July. <laughs> and he said, he said, no, we're having the bar association meeting here next week in Oklahoma City. We'd like to introduce you. And uh, so, uh, anyway, they were very nice to let me finish up my stuff. Took the job, loved it, yeah. but it was pretty evident pretty quickly that if I was going to send three kids to college, I wasn't going to do it as uh, as a state employee as my dad had been most all of his life. Yeah, and so during that time, I got a call from uh, another uh, college uh, colleague from law school. Actually, two of them called me from Kerr McGee and said, uh, it looks like Silkwood's coming back for a new trial. Uh, would you be interested in coming over here to head up the litigation team uh, for, for the defense of that case? And at that time, although I know that precedes you a long time, they'd already made a movie about it. And it was, uh, to my way of thinking, uh, one of the significant the legal things that went on in my lifetime. So, talked about it. It had never been my desire to work as a corporate attorney, but uh, the opportunity seemed great, and the money was better. Mm -hmm. So, Brenda and I said, yeah. So, we stayed here in Oklahoma City. I went to work at Kerr McGee and yeah. kind of started working my way up through the chairs from there. Yeah. And another exciting time, you mentioned, you know, the boys are getting ready to go to college. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. The very first year we moved to Oklahoma City, Mark started at, uh, at the University of Oklahoma, mm -hmm. and uh, Randy was going to be uh, a freshman, and uh, at uh, Edmund Memorial at mm -hmm. the time, and Lance was a seventh grader. Yeah. So we were all, so we were all in here. Yeah. For for the big adventure of the big city. That's great. And one of the things that I know a little bit of as well is is not only did you obviously you know like you said you you were a, you played high school football and basketball and you're a quarterback, but but your sons are pretty athletic as well, right? Yes. Randy's in the Hall of Fame somewhere. The uh, he, he is. Right? Randy. Uh, Mark, our oldest, played football and basketball and, yeah. and uh, went to the state tournament and, and was a good athlete. Randy was seemed to be, of our three, the most natural. He, he was able to uh, play as a child. He yeah. was generally the best one in his class. And by the time he got to high school, we got down here, he, he became a state champion in the 800 meter, uh -huh. played football. But he was, yeah, he was a good athlete. And so was Lance. Lance was really good uh, in elementary school, but he was never, uh, it was never as, he was never the intense competitor uh, that uh, Randy probably was. But uh, I will tell you this one great story about Lance. Uh, he was a senior at Heritage Hall. They had, uh, his friend Brent Johnson was an outstanding uh, track guy and they were uh, in the state meet and Lance had pulled a muscle or something but he talked the coach into letting him run the anchor leg on the on the uh, relay team the two mile relay team and 3200 meters I guess it is and anyway uh, Brent got him a big lead the other two guys held on and Lance held on and won it by an eyelash at, <laughs> at the was maybe the most thrilling thing I ever saw in sports he yeah. just because he was having to drag his leg around but I knew that he had a lot of grit because yeah. he held on to win it they won the state championship for Heritage Hall it was yeah. fun that is awesome yeah that, uh, that's great and those people who know Lance that are listening to this are probably going to be surprised when they hear that story <laughs> which is what I love uh, and Lance is probably listening and he knows exactly you know the well, funny stories that we have and I'm sure there's more uh, he told me when uh, when Randy had was being inducted into his high school hall of fame right he said yes. he didn't tell anybody he just went down there on his <laughs> own he got less through be there. <laughs> yes that's true uh, Oh, which is brilliant. Because the one thing I think a lot of people know of your family is that if someone's winning something, the entire family is there to support, right? Like you're all there. No doubt is, about it. It's the grandkids or a son or whatever it is. Like it's it's something really cool to, to see and, and to follow um, you guys. But moving forward then, when is it that you get the opportunity to... I mean, become a become a uh, go back to Alva to become a president of, of the university. 
Well, uh, worked at worked at Kerr McGee mm-hmm. for 15 years or more, yeah. and uh, kind of worked my way up through out of the law department into management and through mm-hmm. the chairs, and and uh, became vice chairman of the company. And uh, loved Kerr McGee. It was a life changing experience for Brenda and me. We. Uh, responsible for an office in Washington, D.C., up there once a month. Uh, We had to buy insurance from Lloyd's of London, went there once a year. So it was just for for people with our background, it was a it was a significant and life changing opportunity that really, uh, really did transform our lives. And uh, we'll always be grateful of the chairman of Kerr McGee, who hired me, was a fellow named uh, Frank McPherson. Coincidentally, I still do a Bible study with him once a week. Yeah. Uh, he'll be 90 next year, and uh, just one of the finest men I've ever known. And we, anyway, that uh, the, our time at Kerr McGee was really great. So I was, by this time, I was uh, going to be 62 years old uh, in the year 2000. And uh, decided that uh, uh, I'd like to retire. I, I was going to be, I was going to be in a position to retire. And so decided and announced that that would be my last year at Kerr McGee. And at that time, a longtime president at Northwestern retired, and I was asked to serve on the selection committee mm-hmm. as, as one of the alums. Well, I got the first meeting, and some of the some of my friends that I've known over the years said, well, gee, if you're retiring, why don't you apply for that job? And I, and what I guess would be significant about this that I don't want to get too, uh, uh, what do I want to say, corny about it. But when I knew I was retiring at, at Kerr McGee and I was 62 and I was feeling great, uh, although this is probably not evident to you, I've always been kind of a controlled guy. I like okay. to be in charge of what's going to happen to me and my family, and yeah. so I'm always interested. So for the first time in my life, I said, Lord, whatever's out there for me, yeah, just show me what it is. I, I feel good. I, I want to do something. And if it's a greeter at Walmart, uh, if it's coaching Little League, Baseball, whatever is out there for me, uh, show me what it is, and I, I've, I'm open to do yeah. whatever there is to do. Uh, because I was going to be fortunate enough to have a retirement. Mm-hmm. So anyway, yeah. I uh, got a call, met with some friends in Alva. They submitted my name. I went to the interview. Everybody else was qualified. I was not qualified. I, I, of course, did not have a degree in education. I'd never been involved in university administration. And I think if it had been any other university on earth, they wouldn't have even, I'd not gotten past the search firm. I mean, I wouldn't have had the credentials, you know. So anyway, I got into the interview and, the interview was here in Oklahoma City, and I was driving back to work at Kerm again. They called me and said, you've got the job. Wow. And it was just, uh, to me, it was a God thing because it was something I'd never thought about doing. Uh, in my day, uh, people who were presidents of universities had a Ph.D., uh, or at a minimum, they would have had a doctor of education degree. And so my degree was a Juris Doctorate, but hardly a preparation for uh, uh, to be president of the university. However, that had happened in our state. David Boren, who had the same Juris Doctorate degree, was president at OU. And uh, so there were others, including Glenn Johnson, who became chancellor. He was the president at Southeastern. So uh, it wasn't unheard of in those days, although it was rare. Yeah. So I, Brenda and I thought about it, and she wasn't as excited about moving back to Alva, but this time, uh, yeah. you know, after they've seen Perry, it's hard to take them back to the farm. Right. But any, as she always did, mm-hmm. she just backed right up. We moved back, and she spent her time just turning things over out there. Yeah. She really, she redid she read one of the interesting stories was she decided that we needed to redo the president's home. 
And to do that, we had to move out. Right. So we moved into the girls' dormitory, <laughs> which, as I might say, fulfilled yeah. a lifetime desire on my part. <laughs> 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 but they had a they had a suite of room there, a suite yeah. of rooms there reserved for handicapped students that were unoccupied. Mm-hmm. So Brenda and I moved into the girls' dorm, and we lived there yeah. until uh, the spring, and when they got the work done on the president's house. So we moved into the president's house, but she was really active in hosting a lot of events, and. Uh, of course, we knew Alvin. We knew the people there, and yeah. we were able to get a lot of people engaged in helping the university, and we we really loved it. Yeah, well, it's an exciting time, right? And, you know, you're kind of returning to a home, right? You're returning to a place where you've grown so much. You have so many stories from, from whether it's college, having Mark, you know, first child yeah. out there, or I mean, just so many like and so many family memories. Yes. It's really cool to go full circle and come back. And I uh, I believe, if the stats are still right, you're the only former student to become a pre- become a president. I right? was the first one. They you now have one. one. Okay, they, they now, do. They now have another one. Okay. Yeah, their president now was, an, was a Northwestern graduate. Yeah. Yes. But yeah, that was the, kind of the kind of the historical significance yeah. of being the first graduate to ever become president was really uh, uh interesting and inspiring to me. So I was glad to get to do it. Yeah. And even though, like you said, you didn't really know much about education, you knew business and being, you know, 15 plus years or 10, 15 plus years at at Kerr McGee becoming vice chairman, clearly you're good at what you do. Well, and yeah, we knew the people and, and and in those, in those, uh, regional universities, um, the university is generally the biggest, uh, the biggest enterprise in town. Uh-huh. So you gotta, you gotta work in the chamber of commerce, and you gotta help them with everything that's going on in the city. You know, they they want to make sure the highways are good. You know, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. you're just you're just kind of a. It's expected to be a community right. uh, leader if you're going to have that job, and I like that. So it all worked out great. And like I said, you're, you're supposed to retire, and then you go into I'm going to be the president of a university, and I then did. you're you're at events, right? You're you know you're not just running things, but you're at football games, you're at basketball games. Like oh yeah, you have a big schedule. <laughs> I yeah, I and what, the great thing for me was I love that stuff. Yeah, I mean I love going to the football games I, more than any other thing. I love getting to get engaged with the students. I love being a part of it. It's yeah. not like having your own kids play, but it's a lot like it. Yeah. It's a lot like it. Yeah. So then that, being an Alva, that, I guess, job kind of puts you on the map for whenever Oklahoma City, because you know, most people yes. know you as former president of Oklahoma City University as well. So how does that transition? Well, uh, I, again, it, I don't, I don't want to, belabor this it was a god thing yeah but uh i i was at northwestern and uh i got a call from a fellow i knew here named bill shadid he was mm-hmm. chairman of the board of oklahoma city university board of trustees and he said uh when are you going to be in town and uh, could you come by my office and so i went by his office and uh there was an all-star cast there they these are people that are even older than me, but uh, the Bishop of the Methodist Church was there. Herman Minders was there. Uh, one of my favorite people, Ray Ackerman, was there from Ackerman McQueen. Uh, Roy Chandler. And so I walk into this room and these uh, these real uh, these are all people I know. And, and most importantly, uh, Robert S. Kerr Jr., who was on the board at Kerr McGee and who I knew well. Uh, and they were all uh, on the board of trustees at Oklahoma yeah. City University. And I walked in and they said, we've gotten word that our president is leaving. And uh, are you liking what you're doing? And I said, and particularly Bob Kerr knew me because we'd been through a lot together at Kerr, uh-huh. at Kerr McGee. And I said, yeah, I really, I, I think I like it better than anything I've ever done. I really, I really, really like this. And so does Brenda. And uh, so uh, I go back home, go back to Alvin, and a call comes and says, uh, we want you to come to OCU. And Brenda says, oh, my gosh, Tom, we haven't been here at Northwestern. We thought we'd stay five years, and we're, you know, and so forth. Yeah. And so it was, it was not an easy decision. Right. So 
I came to see the bishop of the Methodist Church here, a guy at that time named Bruce Blake, and said, I, I don't want to do, this is a Methodist university. Uh, and I said, I don't, we're Methodist, and so that's an attraction to me, but I don't want to do this if you don't feel good about it. I mean, some of the ministers in the past have been, I mean, some of the presidents have been ministers, and most all of them have had PhDs, and I'm going to be a, a non-traditional guy, and I am i don't want to do this, even if the rest of them want me to, uh, if you don't feel good about it. And he said, uh, well, it, during the history of universities, they need different people for different times. And he said, we're going through some tough financial times. We need to raise some money. We need to get connected to the to the business community in Oklahoma City, and we're thinking you're the guy that could do that. And he said, "I'll do the preaching," and, and you. And so anyway, we moved back. Yeah. And uh, and it was uh, for us love at first sight. We we loved everything about the university, including the Methodist affiliation. We. Uh, the performing arts uh, just were so fantastic that it was hard to believe Brenda and I were there. I mean, these kids just came from all over the country, actually all over the world, mm -hmm. and they were great. We had good sports programs, and, and uh, uh, we had a law school, uh, and uh, they'd been hoping for several years to get accredited by the uh, AALS, the American Association of Law Schools, and that seemed like a doable goal, which I might say we did get that done. So uh, it was uh, kind of a star-crossed path and uh, loved it better than anything I've ever done. Yeah. So, so then for the next nine years, you go on basically a fundraising mission, right? And to improve yes. the school, raise money. Yes. And I know one of the people you just mentioned is in Herman Minders has given a lot of money to OCU and, and, and him and his wife are a huge part of that as well. And, you know, there oh, were, former, Oklahoma, former Oklahoma Hall of Famer as well. There were, there were, it was fortuitous mm -hmm. that there were people who were interested in the university that had means. Uh, Herman, I have said publicly a hundred times, is the most generous man I've ever met. And he, and he's also a tough-minded businessman. I mean, he didn't find his money laying on the street. He earned it. He had a great business, and he uh, taught me a lot about uh, generosity and an interest in helping the next generation. And yes, uh, he gave us probably $35 million while Brenda and I were there, uh, the bulk of which was to build the Minder School of Business. But he also helped the nursing school, which was named for his for LaDonna's family, the Kramer School of Nursing. And he, he was the most interesting guy because he would uh, go into a restaurant and the, and the waiter would come over and he'd say, are you in college? He said, no, I'd kind of like to go, but I don't have the money and Herman said well if you come to OCU uh, to business school I'll pay for it I mean I just can't even tell you how many people yeah. whose lives he affected yeah. and and most of that unknown I mean everybody right. knows about the fantastic business school yeah. and then the second the second person was Wanda Bass uh, I've, I don't want to over stay my time here with you. Oh, we Wanda, got time. You're good. We got Wanda plenty of time. Bass uh, also, uh, she taught me more than anyone I've ever known the joy of giving. Yeah. She, she was uh, uh, a woman whose husband had, and with her help, had uh, created a big bank in McAllister, Oklahoma, and they had a, they had a huge bank and lots of investments and stuff. And she, her daughter came to uh, OCU before I came, and she was an instrumentalist. She's an organist. So the first time I met Mrs. Bass, she came in and said, I would like to make OCU an all Steinway school. And I said, well, I don't know what that means. <laughs> yeah. and I don't know what it takes. Right. So I said, but the, the dean of our music school does, Mark Parker, 
So I said, well, then why don't we just go to the Steinway Company in New York and let's see what that means. So we went up there and basically it said, uh, it turns out we'd have to have uh, 172 pianos. We had lots of, lots of people majoring in music. And it turns out that is the biggest purchase and sale in the history of the Steinway Company. So I come back and I say, Wanda, it's going to cost $4 million, and then they'll have to be maintained. And she said, well, let's just do that. So we did. So we went up there and had a, had a big affair in New York, and they hung, a, they hung a Steinway piano in the 21 Club with Wanda Bass's name on it. And, uh, and that was the beginning of something really fantastic, because yeah. then she said, well, gee, you know, this is... Uh, we got these old buildings, and we. Uh, what are we going to do about that? So, I'll I'll fast forward to say it was not an easy process. Sure. Uh, it, uh, uh, but she gave us the bulk of the money mm -hmm. to build the Wanda Bass School of Music, which uh, cost more than thirty million dollars as well. Wow. And she, but we had a lot of other people help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we went out and asked. She would match what other people gave. Yeah. But. Uh, before we did that, uh, I drove to McAllister and met with her two sons. Uh, and I said, I have appreciated getting to know your mother, and I really appreciate what she's done on the Steinway and sons. She wants to give us $20 million or $25 million to build a new music school. And I'd like to know that you all feel okay about that. I, I, yeah. I, I don't know enough about your family business, but I do know that your mom's about 80 years old. And I, before, yeah. before we move into this, I'd sure like to know that you all approve of it and think it's okay and we're not taking your money. Your future inheritance, yeah. yeah. And so they, anyway, they told me several stories about her generosity and also verified that uh, they were well provided for. Yeah. And they said, this is just her. She's just the most generous person you've ever met in your life, and we're happy for her to do it. So uh, and those two particularly, Ann Lacey was a big donor, gave us $12.5 million. And so we had a lot of people yeah. that helped. Uh, so uh, it, it was a combination, I think, of, of uh, people having some confidence in the university, yeah. but also having the means to do it. And they all appeared at about, at a, you know, in a relatively short period of time. That's amazing to have that firsthand experience of the joy of giving. Oh, right? yes, yes. You know, that's... Yeah, she was just so happy. Yeah. I mean, she, uh, I just can't express it. She and my wife got along beautifully, and uh, she was like Herman. Yeah. Uh, it really gave her joy mm -hmm. to help others. Yeah. And uh, she just... Uh, she was just a wonderful person. Yeah. I heard a story about Herman that he didn't really care for his name to be on the building. He just, you know, he's like, don't worry about it. And, and that someone had to convince him to put his name on the building, not for him, but for his family that would, they, the future generations would see what he'd done. That's true. Right. He was, he was not a person who was looking for a uh, personal, uh, 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 what shall I say? Aggrandizement. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He was just, uh, but I said, Herman, you're, from, my, from where I'm sitting, you're the first domino to fall. Yeah. And if people believe that you are willing to invest $30 million here, I feel good about going to other people and asking them to give us 500000 for a new this. I, I, I feel great about building a new dormitory. I feel great about us uh, getting a new dance school, the Inasmuch Foundation. I feel like we can go to them and ask them to help us build a new dance school. But part of that is because if they believe that you, a, a, a businessman, mm -hmm. believes in what's going on here enough to invest that much money in it, that's you. That's worth it all. And that's why I want your name on the building because I want people to know you believe in what we're doing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, clearly it's worked because he's obviously, you know, gone, gone on to do great things, but the university is thriving and doing great things too. 
he yeah he uh, certainly OCU is not the only good thing he's done he's, yeah, oh, he's helped sure. a lot of other yeah, people yeah, yeah. a lot of other yeah. places I could regale you with uh-huh. stories of of, of things I know for sure he's done, but he absolutely, yeah. this wasn't the only thing. But I, I viewed Herman's contribution not only as generosity, but also as the housekeeping, good housekeeping seal of approval mm-hmm. that there's something really good going on here yeah. and I'm willing to invest in it. Yeah. So then, you know, you're at OCU for nine years uh, from, from 2001 to 2010. Do you, you think I've had enough? I'm going to retire now. I'm, you know, in my seventies, like I should probably try and retire again. <laughs> and Brenda's thinking we should go do different things. Uh well, a little different than that. Okay. Uh, I uh, one of the OCU had had a had had a president who suffered some uh, serious health issues before I got there, and uh, so I assured them when I came and and agreed to put it in my contract that I take a fiscal every year. Yeah. And I said if I if I don't feel if I'm if my health isn't good, I'm not just looking for a job. If my health isn't good. You'll need to get somebody else. Yeah. So, in 2000, at the end of 2004, beginning of 2005, I was diagnosed with cancer. Oh, wow. And so I had some surgery, and everything seemed to be okay. Uh, then, in uh, uh, the years are rolling together for me, but I'm going to say uh, in 2009, I, I had a recurrence of cancer. And I had to go down to MD Anderson and take treatments for a couple of months. And my future looked uncertain. Sure. And so, true to what I told them, I said, I, this is not a part-time job, and this is not a job you can do if you don't feel well, because we lived on campus. I mean, people were knocking on the door saying, Mrs. McDaniel, the soccer game started, and you're not out there. Where are you? You know? So, yeah. uh, so it was a, it was a, I don't want to say 24-7 job, but it, it practically was. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so Brent and I talked it over and decided, gee, if your health is not going to be good. Yeah. Well, so here we are. Uh, so in 2009, I told him that uh, I'd like to leave uh, July the 1st of 2010. Mm-hmm. And they asked me if I would stay for one year with the new with the new president and be chancellor. And uh, it turned out that uh, so I did. So I stayed an extra year after the after Robert Henry came as president, and then left. Uh, but uh, I also think that uh, from some of the reading I've done about university presidents, I kind of think about ten years is enough. It's uh, someone has described it as a battleship. That's to turn, you can't, everybody ought to have five years to kind of get it going in the right direction. And then if you do a great job, maybe another five, but after that, new ideas, new energy, new, is good. So Brett and I felt like the combination of my health and the combination of it's time for somebody else to look at this and see what they can do. Yeah. So we left in, in good spirits, feeling great, university treated us great, uh, was glad to see Robert Henry come, and so it was a smooth transition. Yeah. So do you, at this time then, you know, do, do you have the treatment, everything back on track, we're okay? What, what are people coming to you saying, hey, I know you're, you're not going to do this, you know, you're not going to be president anymore, how about we do this instead? Are people coming to you, you know, friends of yours coming to you with other board opportunities, obligations, things that, that they'd like to get you involved in? Yes, I actually, uh, I wasn't, I didn't have any plans except to stay that extra year. Mm-hmm. And during that year, uh, Bill Durrett and Bill Cameron, Bill Cameron, the Cameron family owns American Fidelity and Bill Durrett's the senior chairman there. Uh, contacted me and said, uh, we've started this foundation and uh, we're looking for someone to run this foundation and do community relations and would you be interested in doing it? And uh, at, at the time I said, I don't think so. I think yeah. I have this, I'm ready to hang it up. And, 
Uh, but then the more I th and a few months passed, and they hadn't hired anybody. Yeah. So they called me back and said, well, has the circumstance changed? And I said, yeah, I think it has. I think I'd like to do that. Yeah. So I went to work at American Fidelity thinking that was for a couple of years, and I've now finished 10. <laughs> You've been here still late. I, I went there in 2011, yeah. so 2022, 11 years, yeah. the 1st of September, and I really like it. Uh, it's uh, one of the things that I had undertaken to do at the end of my time at OCU, yeah. I'd agreed with the mayor and city council that I would chair the MAPS 3 initiative, the Citizens yeah. Advisory Board. And maybe when I agreed to do that, I didn't know how long it would take, but uh, here we are. We, that was in 2010, and so I'm still yeah. uh, still doing that. And But one of the things about working at American Fidelity, they wanted me to do that as part of their community relations. So I spent a fair amount of time working on the MAPS development yeah. for the Chamber of Commerce and for uh, the community. Yeah, and, and over the last 10 years, I, I've been here since August 2011, so over this period, the city, since I've been here, has really grown. It and obviously, has. you've been at the front of that. You know, you've been you know, in the thick of it, very involved with just everything that's going on, and now we have these incredible districts and the park that's opening up, and it's still growing. We have the convention center. It must be really cool to have seen, you know, concrete bare parking lots just become this beautiful park and this scene, but not just there, all over the city as well. It really has. I, I'd have to say it's the most uh, uh, rewarding uh, volunteer job I've ever had. I, I didn't know much about city business, and I've come to appreciate what a fantastic staff they have and what a big business it is and, and what a great job our mayors have done uh, with cities all over the country suffering all kinds of problems and we definitely have problems but we've been able to avert it uh, by investing in ourselves mm -hmm. by this this MAPS 3 one cent sales tax has kept us going uh, now into the fourth iteration but yeah senior wellness centers uh, the river which yeah. is uh, uh, another story in and of itself mm -hmm. uh, the what Mike Knopp and and others have done there has been a almost mind-boggling it's incredible we just had the red bull rapids there yes. and this i mean it's who would have thought that there's a river that close to downtown oklahoma city and, and, and an event space and beautiful buildings that can host you know conference for for rowing every year and all these other incredible water sports it's yes. when you think about oklahoma city you don't think of like yes. water sports right so it's yeah. special well, I, I mentioned earlier, one of the guys that was in the room when I came to OCU was uh, was a guy in my, uh, uh, named Ray Ackerman. Yeah. And there's a book been written about his life called Old Man River. Yeah. But he brought Mike Knopf to my office at OCU and said, we ought to start a rowing program here. Yeah. And uh, we did. And Mike uh, just has has taken that vision mm -hmm. uh, exponentially yeah. uh, beyond what anybody could have possibly thought, certainly beyond what I would have known. Right. Uh, but he started as rowing coach at OCU. <laughs> yeah, because he was a lawyer too, right? Wasn't he, he is a lawyer. He is yes. a lawyer too, yeah. right? He worked for the DA, But he had this big dream. Yeah. And, uh, and the city bought into it. He sold it as a... Uh, uh, as something that would be unique in Oklahoma City. Yeah. So today, when you think about the world we live in, and because of the Ukraine, they cancel the world championships in paddle sports uh, in, in Russia, and they turned Oklahoma City as the venue for the world championships Amazing. in canoe and kayaking. I mean, it's just mind-boggling. For someone like me who's grown up here yeah. and could never have dreamed such a thing could happen, but right. here it is. Yeah, yeah, because it was just it was it was not a place you wanted to go. I'm sure, right That's back right. in the day, it was it, right, and the river was dry. I mean, yeah. it, it took uh, it took uh, uh, effort by the city to put mm -hmm. water in the river, and then uh, Ray. Uh, worked for 25 years getting the name of the river changed to the Oklahoma River. It, it was the uh, North Canadian River. Okay. And uh, yeah. he saw no sense in that. <laughs> so anyway, it was, yeah, it was really, it was really, uh, yeah, 
unusual. Yeah. So finishing up then, you've been around some incredible characters. You know, you mentioned Wanda Bass, Herman Minders, Ray Ackerman, all these people, you know, have just kind of poured into you, but also you've poured into them and collectively you guys have poured into the community. What do you attribute kind of their success, your success to in moving the community forward? Like, is there what, I mean, it's probably hard to put one thing on it, but is there anything that stands out? Well, uh, I guess I guess this I uh, I learned something from football uh-huh. that's really held me and I helped me a lot through life, and that is I got to go to college to play football because I was the best player on a on a in a small high school team. I wasn't in college very long before I knew I would never again be the best player on any team I was ever on. There were a lot of guys there that were bigger, stronger, faster. And I, so, but what I did learn was that I could be a great teammate. And I think more than any other thing, that has been kind of something that always keeps me going. I, I may not be able to do everything well, but what I can do is to try to be a great teammate, try to encourage those uh that I'm brought into contact with. And I think it helps you in your marriage. I think it helps you being a parent. I think it helps you in your work. And I certainly think it helps you in your volunteerism. So my goal is to be a great teammate. And I think, and I've had all these fantastic people whose lives have crossed mine, like Herman and Wanda and Ray Ackerman and and, uh, the bishops of the church and others that have given me opportunities that I would never have thought of, yeah. you know, when I was a youngster. And uh, so it's been a great, great opportunity. Yeah, no doubt. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming down. It's, uh, you know, I know you're still a busy man, you know, at 84 years old, you've got a lot going on. Uh, and like we said before we started recording, you probably didn't think you'd be this busy at 80, you know, at 84 years old. But thank you so much for coming down. I really appreciate everything you and Brenda and your, four, your three sons have done for this city. Um, you know, the legacy will live on long after everyone's, you know, dust and in the ground. And that's just something that is really special that uh, the McDaniel name is known as you know something that we give back and we we give generously and it's through education or just just doing what we do and and that's something that i have seen since i've been here since i first met you at the golf club i kind of knew of just the name and and what that means to to oklahoma city and oklahoma general so thank you on behalf of everyone listening and uh for people listening we'll catch you next episode cheers hope you guys enjoyed that great episode thank you so much for listening as always huge shout out to our sponsors the oklahoma hall of fame share an oklahoma story through its people since 1927 for more information on the oklahoma hall of fame go to www.oklahomahof.com and follow them on instagram for daily updates at oklahoma hof our other sponsor the chickasaw nation amazing sponsor they do amazing things for the state and they're always sponsoring something in oklahoma they're a huge supporter of oklahoma and without their support we wouldn't be able to do what we do and finally our third sponsor for today the oklahoma 988 mental health lifeline 988 is the direct three-digit lifeline that connects you with the trained behavioral health professionals that can get all oklahomans the help that they need learn more by visiting 988oklahoma.com It's 988oklahoma.com. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. We are inspired by those around us and hope that you are too. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform and leave us a review so we can keep telling your stories. For more great Oklahoma content, follow This Is Oklahoma on Facebook and Instagram.